Hey all, this is Reddit Oscar. Today I want to talk about some games that could be coming in 2024, but that don't have an announced release date. So this is going to be games that have an announcement, but we don't know when they're coming out, or games that don't even have an announcement, but we can probably assume exist, and are in active development. Since this list is covering the games that don't have release dates, the information on these titles is sparse. So in this video I'm going to be talking about what little we do know, and then talk about why they have me excited. And we're going to start with Metroid Prime 4. The game was announced at E3 in 2017, and Nintendo confirmed that Retro Studios, who had developed the previous Metroid Prime games, would not be working on Metroid Prime 4. In 2018, Reggie, the at-then president, said that development for Metroid Prime 4 was proceeding well. Finally, in 2019, Shinya Takahashi announced that development on Metroid Prime 4 had restarted, this time under Retro Studios. Takahashi said that the previous studio had not met Nintendo's standards, and the decision to restart had not been taken lightly. And that's basically it, we got no information past that. But in February of 2022, the Retro Studios Twitter changed their banner to this picture, possibly or probably being concept art for Metroid Prime 4. And that's it. Apart from that, we have no information. I love Metroid Prime. I like Metroid Prime probably more than I like the actual 2D Metroid games, including the recent very popular Metroid Dread. What I like about the Prime games is that they successfully took a lot of the elements that made the 2D Metroids good and transferred them into a 3D space. The most important of which is the feeling of wonder and solitude that comes from exploring a foreign, hostile alien planet. That feeling in Super Metroid where you land on Zebus for the first time. The area is desolate and there's a storm raging. And you're expected to go off and explore this unknown territory with little guidance and a constant undercurrent of wonder and threat. And Metroid Prime does that too. When landing in Talon 4 you get the sense that you are in a place that is foreign and wild. Exploring gives you the sense that you're in an old place and that your explorations will be forcefully opposed by the natural environment, by the intelligent space pirates that crash-landed, and by something else, other things more mysterious, that you must discover. And the games are a little bit like Dark Souls in that they set the right mood, it has a lot of environmental storytelling, and very little is directly said to the player. Instead, a great deal is written, which supplements the world-building and complements the atmosphere. In Metroid Prime games, this is done through the scan visor, there's a lot of scannable objects in the game. Every enemy and most animals and plants can be scanned, and it'll give you a lot of information. Some of it will be useful and practical, such as strategies for defeating enemies, and some of it will be flavor text that adds to the world building. You might find murals, and these murals might tell you about the area and the world, or you could scan a Federation Marine, and it'll tell you about that Marine's last moments, or his relationship to other Marines, corpses that you found along the way or their thoughts on the situation before they died, or even foreshadowing something that might happen later. I love Metroid Prime's exploration, the atmosphere that you feel while you're exploring, and the world building that you discover while you're exploring. And it's something that other games have a hard time replicating. In fact, Metroid Prime has a hard time replicating it. Metroid Prime 3 was a fun game, but it was lacking in the aspects I just described. And I'm hoping Metroid Prime 4 recaptures that essence. That feeling that you get while exploring that's important not just to the Prime games, but to Metroid games in general. And while we're on this topic, the next game on the list is Metroid Prime 2 Remastered. The original rumor said that the first Metroid Prime game would get this remaster that we got, the very high quality remastered. But that Metroid Prime 2 and 3 wouldn't receive the same treatment, they would come to the Switch as HD ports. And Jeff Grubb, an insider who's gotten a lot of things right in the past, said that Metroid Prime 2 Remastered should be coming out relatively soonish, that it's going to be what people mostly want, that it will have modern controls, but that it will not have the love and care that Metroid Prime got. Now the issue is, that quote from Jeff Grubb happened around five months ago, on July 18th, 2023. And when he made that declaration about Metroid Prime 2 Remastered, he also said that something unrelated to Tears of the Kingdom would happen with Zelda later that year. It is now next year, and nothing like that happened. 
And given how much time it's been, it's not relatively soon anymore. Metroid Prime 2 still has not arrived. We don't have anything. And so my hope is that Nintendo saw the success of the Metroid Prime 1 remaster, it sold over a million copies, where the original only sold about 2.8 million copies. And they saw that, and they decided, okay, given the success of the original Metroid Prime remastered, let's give Metroid Prime 2 its own remastered as well. And if you followed my channel for a while, you'll understand how unusual it is for me to say that. Because in general, I'm very anti-remake. I made a video about the Demon's Souls remake explaining my problems with it. But generally my issues are that remakes often change the tone, the atmosphere of the story, or the story itself. Or they'll change the colors or the art direction. Or the people developing the remake will fundamentally misunderstand what made the original good. And in attempting to modernize and improve it, they end up damaging those qualities. Even if a remake does a good job and it's faithful overall, it's often not faithful in important ways. And so in most circumstances, I don't want a remake. I would prefer an HD port. But not so with the Metroid Prime Remastered. I think it should be the gold standard for any kind of remake, any kind of remastered going forward. It's very close to perfect. If I wanted to nitpick, I could say that Fendara's Drift doesn't have enough snow falling or that the projectiles don't emit light like the original GameCube version, or that the little mirror doesn't have Samus's reflection anymore. But given this remastered staggering accomplishment, I'm inclined not to care too much. Just look at what's on your screen. This is a triumph. This is what Faithful looks like. This is what Faithful to the spirit of the original means. What I find so impressive about it is that the art direction really is the same art direction. It's the same art direction, just with better graphics. It's incredible. All the assets have been redone, all the textures remade, and makes a 20-year-old game the best-looking game on the Nintendo Switch. All while running on a solid, unflinching 60 frames per second. And it would be a terrible crime not to do the same for Metroid Prime 2. Because Metroid Prime 2 is actually my favorite in the trilogy. And I would love to see it receive the same treatment, not HD ports. You know, Jeff Grubb had said that it was going to come relatively soon. It's been six months, five months. So assuming it was true that they were working on HD ports and no ports have been announced or released yet, it is my hope that Nintendo saw the success of the Metroid Prime Remastered and instead changed their mind and decided to give Metroid Prime 2 the full remastered treatment. Assuming, of course, that it's Retro Studios doing it and they treat the second game's atmosphere and art direction with the same care. Alright, the next game that I'm interested in is a new game from Yoko Taro, the mind behind Nier, Nier Automata, and the Dragon Guard games. In November 2023, the Nier series producer, Yosuke Saito, said that while Yoko Taro is alive, they will release a new entry in the Nier series, but that they're also working together on a different project unrelated to Nier, a project that they hope to talk about in 2024. Saito later said in December that he's working hard, when asked to describe 2024, he simply said surprise as the main keyword. Then he said, I'm preparing various things to be able to carry out the surprise mentioned in the keyword in early 2024. So what I'm hoping for here is a new Yoko Taro game, be it a new Nier game or a game that they're working on that is unrelated to Nier. I don't care. I just want a new major project that Yoko Taro is directing. Here's the problem. It's not like Yoko Taro hasn't been working on anything. He has been working on things, it's just things I don't like. He's made a bunch of mobile gacha games while I patiently wait for a new project. He has also made the voice of card games. They're turn-based RPGs where everything is cards. All the graphics are cards, the enemies are cards, the players are cards, and it has a kind of Dungeons & Dragons structure where a game master will tell you what's happening and speak for all the characters. And they're not bad, they're not terrible games, they're, they're fairly enjoyable. But I look at them, and I can't help but think to myself, these are like an experiment. These are like, how can I extract the maximum amount of money with the least amount of work? Because while everything about them is quite well done, I feel like I'm being manipulated. Because the art in the cards is similar to Drakengard art. The music is by Keichi Okabe's company. The games all have one voice actor because it's the Game Master and he speaks for your characters, he speaks for the enemy characters, it speaks for everybody. It narrates what happens. And there's no graphics to speak of other than the cards. 
and he's made three of these, and I'm sick of it. There's nothing wrong with the games, but I am of the opinion that Yokotaro should be placed in a basement underneath Square Enix offices, and forced to work on major projects unrelated to gacha games that make him untold amounts of money, unrelated to these voice of card games that might be canonically tied to the Nier games. When I played Drakengard 1 for the first time, I used to think, wow, this director is really creative. I hope that one day he becomes popular and gets the budget and creative freedom to make whatever he wants. But it turns out what he wants to make is money and voice of card games. And so now I'm much less interested in letting him have freedom and creativity because his best work seems to have happened in bondage and obscurity. All right, in the same vein, I'm also looking forward to Fumito Ueda's next work. Fumito Ueda is the legendary director for Ico and Shadow of the Colossus and The Last Guardian, the first two which I consider peerless masterpieces. And I'm not the only one. Both Hidetaka Miyazaki and Yokotaro have declared themselves as fans of Fumito Ueda, and they both cite Ico as a great inspiration. Ueda started his own company, Gen Design, and in 2018 he revealed that the studio was working on a new game. In 2021, the new game was teased in Gen Design's New Year postcard. The postcard shows images of Ueda's previous games, and art from a game we haven't seen which is assumed to be his new work. In 2023, they made a New Year post, where they said it was finally the year where they can bring us lots of topics. And it was assumed that they would talk about their new game that year. They did not. Then this year in 2024, their new card said, Gen Design is currently working hard on a new project while experiencing the hardships of birth. Perhaps in an effort to be more conservative, they didn't say that they would bring us topics this year. And apart from that, we have no information. The thing about Ueda is that he really left a mark in the industry. Even though he's only made three games, his influence is undeniable. I think we're unlikely to get a 2024 release for whatever he's working on, but I would like at least a little bit of information this year. Alright, next let's talk about Silk Song. Silk Song is the sequel to the critically acclaimed Hollow Knight, a 2017 Metroidvania that had you explore the remnants of the kingdom of Hollow Nest. Hollow Nest is an archetypical, dilapidated, but once great kingdom. As you explore the many locations, you'll be able to piece together what happened to the kingdom and why through various pieces of lore. It also has a robust and significantly challenging combat system. The game is not as Souls-like, but it is like Dark Souls in that it has a obscure story that is in need of discovery and interpretation. Thankfully, both the story and the journey to discover it are both really good. A problem I have with games that attempt that narrative style is that they don't do a good job at it because the story that they're requiring me to discover is usually not worth the effort. And I didn't feel that way about Hollow Knight, I enjoyed the journey and the destination. Now as for the sequel Silk Song, there is no news. There's nothing to talk about. There doesn't seem to be any evidence or indication of when it's going to come out, whether it's going to be this year or next. We know it's not cancelled, we know that they're still working on it, but there's no telling when it could come out. There could be an announcement tomorrow and I wouldn't be surprised. Finally, the last game is a DLC for Katana Zero. Katana Zero is a side-scroller 2D action platformer. You play as a katana-wielding assassin, clearing assassination contracts with your ability to slow down time and predict the future. It's also a surprisingly story-driven game. I found the writing and dialogue to be very high quality, and can be intense, touching, or funny when needed. The gameplay is similar to Hotline Miami. Levels are filled with enemies that you kill in one hit and that can kill you in one hit, and give you the freedom to approach the situation how you want. Every room represents a checkpoint, and when you die, you'll return to the beginning of that checkpoint. And there's a nice in-universe reason for why this happens. The protagonist can see the future, and he uses that ability to see what would happen if he tried to do something. So any time that you die, any run that you fail, that's him using his power to predict the future and seeing what would happen and deciding that's not how to approach this level. Any time you succeed represents the time that he actually did it. The protagonist Zero can reflect bullets with his katana, which can be made easier with your ability to slow down time temporarily. That ability goes on cooldown so you won't be able to just do it all the time. You can also pick up and throw objects such as knives, pots, lamps, and all this works together to make the combat fast-paced and incredibly fun. It feels great when you get better at the game and you can start clearing out rooms more quickly, more efficiently, more stylishly, with fewer attempts or even first try. 
and deaths have no real penalty, you're immediately put back into the situation and given an opportunity to try again. There's no slowdown. If you liked Hotline Miami's combat at all, even a little bit, then you'll definitely enjoy this one. In my opinion, it's much better. I'm not going to spoil anything for the story, because as I've said, it's very good. But I will say it's a real highlight, and effectively delivers mystery and meaning, as you tackle the missions and levels that make up the overall plot. Now for the DLC, it was announced in 2019, and was announced as free downloadable content. But the plans for the DLC continued to grow, eventually it became six times the planned size, at about half the size of the main game. The developer has stated that it's less like a DLC, and more like a Katana 1.5. Despite its size, the DLC is still planned to be free. The developer has also said that it will resolve some plot threads and continue the world building, and that future games of his would connect to Katana Zero's fictional universe. So my 2024 hopes is of course the DLC releasing, but also more information on future projects, since they promise to expand on the story and connect to the Katana Zero universe. Alright, that's the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching.